Добрый вечер, дорогие друзья. Меня зовут Гала. Я продюсер. Good evening, dear friends. My name is Gala. I'm the producer of Stimoka Summer Program. Thank you very much for joining us today. See the day off, and this is 6 p.m. Pleased to see all of you. And let me introduce our lecturer. And before I do that, I have to say that this current lecture is great networking of Strelka that we are doing. John Goodman, who is an author of Design Scarcity, this book was published by Strelka several years ago. But the topic of design scarcity, which he is talking about today, is very relevant even currently because the issues of ecology, environment in Moscow currently become very, very hot discussed. We have some separate waste bins, for example, we in Strelka practice that, and this is really very interesting and invigorating for Moscow, and I think it's very relevant for Moscow as well. John, he is architect, and it absolutely coincides with Strelka's agenda, and currently he is dealing a lot with ecology, which coincides with the agenda of Moscow, and I'm pretty sure that it would be a brilliant lecture, have a good time, and I give the floor to John, the floor is yours, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you to Strelka on a number of fronts, actually. Um, they've been incredibly generous, first of all, in, in publishing uh, our book a couple of years ago, which I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. But the, the, what brings me here today is uh, part of a new research project, um, which is called Derailed Lab. And there's a number of uh, participants in the room uh, with us today who are part of this project, and I'll, I'll end by talking a bit more about that. But this is uh, a project which is looking at trying to use art and design methods to track um, a series of, of, take a series of sections across the planet, as it were. And so we're here right now as part of a trip. We started in St. Petersburg. We're taking the Trans-Siberian Express to Vladivostok. We'll then be returning back here, and we'll be here again on the 6th of August. So if any of you are around, you're very welcome to come and see us again there. We're going to be making, we're not entirely sure what we're going to do yet, but we're going to be making something on the train and on the journey. And that's actually going to be the first of a series of journeys that we're taking, that we're going to be operating as a derailed lab. And future journeys are likely to be quite possibly a, a journey along the Silk Route, quite possibly a journey along the, river, uh, the Rio Grande between um, the United States and Mexico, one along uh, Pan American from Canada down to Chile. And the point of these journeys is to take, um, to try to find a way of grasping issues around globalization, if you like, issues around uh, looking at economic, ecological, social, anthropological, geographical uh, mappings of the world and using, but trying to use methods which are generated out of art, design, architectural practices. We'll be uh, issuing another call, so keep an eye on uh, the website www.derailedlab.org. Um, if you're all absolutely welcome to um, join us on future trips, they're, they're intended to be transdisciplinary. The, the group we've got at the moment is, whilst it has a, a, a base of, of architecture um, students and teachers, there's uh, journalists, there's uh, makers of various kinds in the group, and, and it's meant to be a transdisciplinary uh, exercise. So if that interests you in any way, then do uh, keep a tab on what's going on and do uh, join us again on the 6th of August um, to see uh, what we've made of, of this trip, uh, at least at that point. We'll be then, we'll be taking that work to, there's a Russian contemporary art gallery in London called the Grad Gallery, who have uh, partnered with us, uh, uh, helped us actually with a number of connections on this trip. So we'll be then representing our work in London. And after we've uh, completed a couple of expeditions, that will then be published uh, in some way. So this is, this is intended to be a, a, a growing uh, research exercise, if you like, and, and, and it's uh, open to everyone. So if, if that is interesting to you in any way, then do uh, keep, in, keep in touch. Now, the, the talk today, originally when I was uh, discussing it with, with Strelka, we thought that it would be interesting to update, as it were, the, the work that we had done on scarcity. However, then in further discussions yesterday, actually, when we were here, and one of the, again, one of the things to, to thank Strelka for is that they gave us some space here to have a seminar. We had a fantastic seminar with um, Daria from the, from the practice office here yesterday. 
And so, we're, yeah, just incredibly grateful for all of that. And I've decided today to try to um, basically take a series of fragments from research projects that I've been involved in in recent years. So, I'm first of all, going to give you, um, uh, if you like, the, the kind of background that frames uh, a lot of the thinking I've been involved in. Then we'll be looking at um, the scarcity and post-scarcity research. There's then uh, a, a second piece of research that I've been involved in, which is loosely titled Reimagining the Project of Planning. I'll, I'll give you a, a, a second fragment from that. There'll be then moments uh, from both uh, a book which is due out shortly, which is a, a coming out of my PhD work a few years ago, called The Architecture of the Extended Mind, and also a, a second body of work which was entitled Critical Urban Ecology. So those are, if you, if you like, the, the four titles on the, on the right here are, are four research strands from things that I've been involved in uh, in the last 10 years, really. At the bottom are two research vehicles. One, the Department of Ontological Theatre, is a name for uh, basically a studio that I run at the Royal College of Art in London. And the Derailed Lab, I've already mentioned, is actually what, what brings, brings me here today. You might recognise, or some of you might recognise, um, the picture in the background here, this is actually from Athens. I've, I've, Athens is one of the cities I've been, I've been repeatedly visiting in recent years uh, because of its interesting uh, political situation. And, that, and I took that as the title for tonight's talk, seeing as it wasn't simply a scarcity thing, but actually I'm taking a series of fragments from my work. So I'm burning and looting from my own, from my own stuff here. Okay, the, the scarcity project, just to give you an overview of that, this was uh, a project which was led by uh, Professor Jeremy Till, who's based at Central St. Martins in London. And this started five years ago. We got, we, first of all, Jeremy approached me, would I be interested in uh, helping to write a bid? We did that together with Andreas Rumpfuber from the Technical University in Vienna, who some of you might know of, um, and also a group based in Oslo. It was a, it was a project, a three-year project that was funded by the European Union and by the HERA group in the European Union, uh, Humanities in Europe, Research Association. And there was a series of, of publications which came out of that, including an issue of architectural design, and the, um, the final thing was the design of scarcity, uh, which, as, as, as already been mentioned, was published by Strelka. Uh, but in order to understand what, what was kind of driving, driving the, what we were looking at here, there's a series of, of yeah, just kind of context-related things that we need to look at. So this is the first. This is a, a graph which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. This is a graph which charts carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and temperature over the last half a million years. And one of the things that should immediately stand out to you is that there's you know, a correlation between the, the blue and the red, the blue and the red um, curves on the graph, a fairly tight correlation. We've got an oscillation around a, a medium value there. So we've got uh, yeah, half a million years on, over on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we've got uh, carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million. And that's been oscillating roughly around the 250, 260 figure. And that oscillation, interestingly, actually, is, is, is a common feature of complex systems. Complex systems typically, and by complex systems, I mean systems which, which are, have multiple levels and where there's multiple feedbacks moving between levels. And so this would include, certainly include, the, the, um, uh, the uh, climate of this planet and the, and the general biosphere of this planet. It would include any living system. So, you know, if you're looking at your own temperature, if you're measuring your breathing, almost any complex system exhibits behavior like this, a kind of, you know, a regular oscillation. If you just look at uh, a, a thermostat and a radiator in a room, you'll see the same thing, you know. The thermostat kicks in, radiator comes on, the temperature rises. When it, when it hits a, a, you know, a set level on the thermostat, it will turn off, it will fall. It will then actually fall below the level that you've set it at, and then it will kick in again and it will rise. So any system with um, actually sort of negative feedback in, in systems theory, cybernetic terms, will uh, organize itself around a, a regular mean. And so we see our planet doing that. Now the thing you don't necessarily notice, first of all, is the vertical red line on the, on the far right of the graph. So that's the Industrial Revolution. Carbon dioxide levels just rising in a straight vertical line. Yeah, on, on the time scale, there's, there's, no, yeah, there's no horizontal movement whatsoever. Interestingly, this is a graph that I um, first started using when I start, first started talking and looking at this 
around 10, 15 years ago. If we now just update, if we now update that, I took, um, there's a website, co2now.org, which uh, charts the, uh, uh, from the uh, monitoring station on Hawaii, the Manoa Loa uh, monitoring station on Hawaii. Uh, results for June this year have just been released. We're now at 406.81 parts per million. So we're actually already off of this graph, the graph that yeah, I started using 10 or 15 years ago. We're at 380 here. So we're now up here somewhere. And I've just put on there you know, some key figures um, for yeah, our predicted peak at the moment is at around 650 parts per million. Um, the the, you know, the large-scale climate chalks, which are, bit, which are typically failing, um, but are, are, you know, so, so the famous IPCC um, report a couple of years ago was aimed at, you know, what could we do to stop, um, to, to reach a peak of 550 parts per million. Now, and Kyoto Plus, you know, one, one of the, um, you know, one of the things that environmental activists were, were you know, have been heavily campaigning for um, in, in the last decade or so, was aimed at trying to, to reach a peak to 440 parts per million. Now, what's immediately clear about that is that you know, all of these are just you know, completely outside of the planetary norm for the last half a million years. You know? And we don't know, we simply do not know what effects really that this is going to have in, in, in you know, the long-term behavior of the planet. And we're just built in, you know, there's climate change now built in. That we, and, and the point is that we, you know, simple methods of trying to prevent this, it's already too late. So actually one of the things we need to do is, is just actually you know, develop flexible systems for responding to the inevitability of climate change events. Um, now, I could spend a lot of time talking about this. There's a lot of material that I need to um, get through, so I'm going to move on. This, by the way, is the I just screen grab from the website this morning. Um, it's always one, it's worth, it's worth keeping an eye on that. But carbon dioxide is actually just one of a small number of, of changes which are happening to the planet. This is uh, the Living Planet Index. Um, collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund and, and uh, uh, UN. This was uh, just documenting, recently been updated to um, document changes between 1970 and 2010. And we're looking at around, you know, just huge collapses in the, in the biosphere across all different biosphere regions, whether it's terrestrial species, freshwater species, marine species. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's you know, some, yeah, you, can, you can question and dispute the data in various ways, but the, but the tendency is, is absolutely unquestionable and, and the, the, yeah, the kind of scale is unquestionable too. So in, and one of the things to remember about us is that we're at the, the top of the food chain, which is actually the most precarious place to be. You know, we can't photosynthesize, you know, we're not like plants, we can't stand in the sun and, and just generate energy directly from the sun. We require either plants to do that for us or indeed other animals to do that for us and, and we you know, get it, yeah, we're at the top of the food chain which, which is, as I say, a very precarious place to be. And there's a series of um, you know, charts that we can start to look at and these are yeah, in, in some ways just grabbing research from, from other groups uh, around the planet, um, looking at general resource use and what you'll start to see is uh, a series of curves that start to look quite similar. So just as the um, carbon dioxide curve was, was just hitting a straight vertical line, if we look at resource use generally, we're looking at curves of a similar nature. Indeed, if we look at anything from debt to emissions to um, other forms of debt here again, actually, economics, Again, I'm, I'm, because of time, I'm just going to move through some of these, or I'm happy to return to some of these uh, later if, if, we, um, if, if questions go in this direction. And other groups, you know, just looking at the likely, the, the so-called peak everything, you know, resources, how long they're likely to um, last given our current rates of use and our current ways of using them. And so this was the kind of context for the scarcity project. It's, you know, what's, what role is design playing in the use of resources? What role is it playing in constructing ideas, just concepts about how we're using resources? But actually, one, one of the key things for us was that, in some ways, a lot of this information is kind of misleading. And uh, we'll you know, try to explain um, how and why that is. 
Uh, this is an uh, interesting update, you know, one of the scariest. So one of, one of the um, early pieces of work uh, was, was a report called the Limits to Growth Report that was produced in the early 70s um, by a group around uh, Don Donella Meadows. And th so they predicted, initially their predictions are, um, yeah, so they produced this result, report, as I said, published in 1970. Um, the dotted lines are indicating, it was actually one of the very earliest uh, computerized uh, complex systems models, where they attempted to model the global economy, resource use, population, as a series of interacting uh, systems. So this, this was taking uh, innovations in systems theory, in ecological theory in the broadest sense. So one, one of the interesting things about ecological theory is that it's, it's a holistic, um, it's an attempt at a holistic science, if you like. If, in, if tendentiously modern sciences are um, reductionist, that is to say they work by breaking things down into their smallest parts, which is, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a very successful way of doing science. You know, so you break living things down into genes and cells and so on, or you break matter down into atoms and quarks and so on. You know, I mean, that's, that's a very, it works. But one of the things that doesn't do is give you an overview of how things are interacting. And so there's a series of, throughout the 20th century, or even indeed, actually, I mean, this starts in the 19th century, a series of attempts to look at how complex systems behave. And, yeah, so, yeah, so this, yeah, early forms of this were cybernetics, systems theory, complexity theory, chaos theory. Ecology, in various ways, yeah, is, is, is one of those terms which captures um, you know, a, whole, a whole number of, of, of these disciplines. And so this was the Limits to Growth report was... Uh, you know, one, one of the early, earliest digitized versions of that. Now, what's interesting here is we can then see that the, this was looked at again 30 years after its initial publication, and there's actually a more up-to-date one as well, actually, which has recently come out, although I don't have the graph for that, but, it, but it's basically mirroring the same. And, so, and what we're seeing here is what's actually happened in these solid lines compared to their prediction. And so whilst they weren't absolutely spot on, they're actually um, pretty close. And they're, pre they're predicting economic collapse in a few years' time, which is... And people like James Hansen, an uh, uh, eminent scientist from uh, NASA, um, you know, is, is, is just you know, one of many, many people who are worth following uh, in, in you know, commentators today. He's basically, again, this is actually a quote which is already a few years old, so he's in this quote here. He's saying, you know, if we, if, it, if we can't reduce CO2 from its current level of 385, as I said, its, it's current level is now 20, 23 parts per million higher than that already. And there's just, there's absolutely no political agenda on the table at the moment whatsoever for getting it down to 350 parts per million, which is what he's calling for there. What, Na what NASA, <laughs> indeed, is, is, is um, calling for. And the point is, you know, it's not a problem for the planet, actually. You know, the planet is a complex system. The, the planet and life on the planet will survive. It will reorganize. It's a very complex self-adjusting system. The question is, will it organize itself in ways that allows us to survive or allows us to maintain, you know, something like a, a global civilization? And the kind of, you know, these, these diagrams below are, are what are called, uh, you know, epi, epigenetic graphs. They're just showing how um, you, you get complex, complex systems have tipping points points at which they then go down a route which you can kind of visualize as a ball rolling along a surface. And once it's taken a route, you know, it requires a huge amount of energy, a huge amount of effort to then get it into the next valley. And it's not at all clear, you know, this might be a valley we're in at the moment that supports human life, this one might not. So David Harvey is a, a geographer I'm sure familiar to um, some of you, if not I would, I would strongly recommend looking at some of his stuff. And he makes the point, you know, if you think that you can solve the environmental question of global warming and all that kind of stuff without actually confronting the whole question of who determines the value structure, then you've got to be kidding yourself. And the point here is, is that these are, you know, th this isn't something which can just be adjusted by some behavioral changes here and there. You know, I mean, we should be doing those things. We should be, you know, recycling and so on. But the, but the you know, the, the forces shaping this are far, far greater than that. We need to look at the very ways that we're um, valuing uh, our economic and ecological beha behavior on the planet. And so this was the kind of, this was the broad context of the, of the scarcity project. And there were different tendencies uh, within the group. It was a, it was a really interesting uh, three years. 
And scarcity is a term which, it's a, it's a key term within mainstream economics. Because actually, the entirety of, of, if you like, capitalist economics is actually based upon scarcity in various ways. The whole valuation model that, that you know, mainstream economics uses is one of supply and demand. It's based upon restricted supply. And one of the things that became clear to us, and, and I'm you know, sort of giving you the, the kind of highlights here, is that actually an awful lot of the discussion that I've just presented to you, and an awful lot of the way in which this discussion has been presented, as if there's just you know, fixed reserves of resources, which are kind of getting used up in a linear way, that actually itself is a political problem, as in, in just in terms of its very presentation, insofar as it's suggesting, it, it's depoliticizing things. You know, it's actually suggesting a, a linear model, um, and it's suggesting that these things are, are kind of sort of you know, natural, if you like, it, it naturalizes. And what became very clear is that actually resource use in almost every single case is always socially constructed, that these are actually social categories and that we need to um, you know, find ways of, of understanding them as social and political categories and actually politicizing the, uh, yeah, the environmental discourse to a far greater de degree than it has been um, so far politicized. And I'll, I'll come back to some of these terms later. So one of the things in, in the, in the um, small stroke book, which is you know, like, like that series, is, is basically a kind of extended essay. And we, we basically had four, we, we, we weren't sure what kinds of diagrams, if any, to use. We ended up just using um, four graphs, three of which are here. Now the first one um, charts the uh, a 19th century um, economist, early economist, early ecologist actually to some extent, uh, the Reverend Malthus. Who and, and so the whole the term Malthusian you may well have come across if, if, if you're looking at any of this material. And Malthus predicted that uh, there was going to be resource issues for industrial civilization. And he, and he is one of the main people who's kind of put, in, put the idea that population is a problem into people's heads. And actually, one of the things that not only our work, but actually other projects that have looked at very similar issues, interestingly, population is actually not a problem. It's actually a relatively insignificant factor compared to the social systems that those populations are existing within. But Malthus basically said, well, if you've got um, that food, he, he suggested that, that production in general, when he was particularly looking at food, he said, yeah, rises uh, arithmetically, population rises geometrically, you're going to get a point where you're going to have more population than you can feed. And it was an incredibly persuasive argument, but it's actually wrong. And, and, it, and, it, and it can be demonstrated to be wrong. I mean, you, you can, if you're interested in that, you, you, can, you can chart that yourself. Actually, you know, technology and so on transforms how we produce. So actually, we, 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 we are capable of producing a great deal. And one of, the, one of the kind of key things of understanding in relationship to scarcity is that actually we are in an economic system which is actually going out of its way to produce scarcities. Because that's the only way that the kind of economy that we've got at the moment can construct value. And this is a point that I'm going to come back to a number of times. So we go out of our way, this seems counterintuitive, we've actually got an economy which is capable of producing abundance, and I'll come back to explain how that can be, but actually at the moment it has to produce scarcities. How does it do that? In some ways, you can say that the environmental crisis itself is actually one of capitalism's ways of trying to save itself. It's actually one of the ways of, of generating scarcities, of, of guaranteeing a certain kind of value structure. Much more mundane ways, you know, things like this. It's, you know, we, we design products that, that you know, we could design washing machines that last 100 years. We could design cars that last 100 years. We could design phones that last more than six months. We're actually in a system that constantly generates new scarcities, that con generates redundancy, that generates things which are designed to fail very quickly. Epsom, you know, were taken to court a couple of years, that they, Epsom printers literally had a chip inside them that was counting how many prints you did that just shut down the printer after a certain number of prints. You know, we, we literally design things so that they will fail after a short number of, amount of time and then need replacing. Now, this is particularly the case in product design, but it's absolutely, you know, architecture and urbanism play interesting complex roles in relationship to this. Now, the, the other two graphs here, which, which we, you know, use in our argument is saying, well, the way in which we imagine growth at the moment is in general that, you know, 
there's a progress. That progress in general is this kind of upward line, you know, that's kind of manageable, that you know, is, is shooting off into the future, and will just keep rising. You know, in this in this case here, you know, the longer time goes, the higher this goes. But you've still got time. You've still got progress. Now, as, as you saw in the number of the graphs that I showed you earlier, almost anything that we care to graph at the moment is actually producing lines like this. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's actually, you know, there's no future here. This, this, you know, this is, is turning vertical, and at a certain point, these flows are literally not moving into the future. Now, how we interpret that is really interesting. So there's actually a, a, a few interpretations. So one is the kind of limits to growth type people saying, well, you know, we are just facing economic stroke civilizational collapse. Other people, people like Ray Kurzweil or any number of people saying, well, this just is, is actually representing some kind of singularity, some kind of absolute transformation in the nature of our economy or in the nature of our society, which, which just actually then requires a different form of measurement. So that's a kind of more optimistic reading. And I think that, yeah, and there's ways of making that optimistic reading. So that's one of the things that we want, yeah, I want to support here. But how can we, how can we actually do that? And how can we deal with the real problem of, at the moment, yeah, we are in a system that, in many respects, and you can literally chart it for yourself, has no future. This, by the way, is the website, the www.skybe.eu. That's the website of the research project. That's got all of the various papers and so on that we did, and there's lots of links there. So that's quite an uh, uh, interesting resource if you want to chase that more. This was the graph. That's actually one of the, this, I think, my final summary paper, Fuck Scarcity, is on there, um, which kind of summarizes from my point of view, because there, there were different points of view within the group. Um, and the graph that we ended up with, the graph that we closed the book with, was actually a drawing by Paul Clay. But we said, you know, until we start to get, see economists and, and us, you know, just actually enabling us to sort of visualize systems, to visualize graphs that look more like this, then you know, we're, we're not in control, we're not actually visualizing things properly. You know. So yeah, just uh, some people who are, who are kind of making similar points. So David Harvey again. Scarcity is socially organized in order to permit the market to function. Andy Merrifield, another uh, interesting commentator. The fundamental basis of a capitalist economy, of a society based on the profit motive on exchange value and money relations is scarcity, the active creation and perpetuation of scarcity. Which, as I say, you know, this seems counterintuitive. It seems the opposite of what capitalism is doing in some ways. But actually, if you, when you look below the surface, that's precisely what it's doing. Murray Bookchin, an uh, anarchist theorist from the um, 60s and 70s, who, who was, it turned out, doing some very prescient work on this. So the, the industrial capitalism of Marx's time organized its commodity relations around a prevailing system of material scarcity. The state capitalism of our time organizing it, organizes its commodity relations around a prevailing system of material abundance. A century ago, scarcity had to be endured. Today, it has to be enforced. And so the, the point, yeah, just to keep relaying these points. So there's a real, really clear way that one of, the, one of the ways in which we can understand why we're in an ecological crisis is that this is actually capitalism's way of saving itself. I can't make this point enough, or I'll try and make it from different angles, explain it in different ways. But it's, it's, it's a, a, possibly the best way of generating scarcities into the future, of generating a certain system of value. And Bookchin goes on, he actually makes a, an extremely interesting psychological reading around this, which is beyond the scope of today's lecture, although maybe in, you know, in questions or in the bar later I can talk about. Scarcity is more than the condition of scarce resources. The word, if it is to mean anything in human terms, must encompass the social relations and the cultural apparatus that foster insecurity in the psyche. So he's, for Bookchin, and, and it's kind of close to Marx's reading of alienation, actually, in, in various ways. Um, it's actually the, 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 protect, the possibility of scarcity is actually, if you like, the kind of key trauma of, of living systems. And that actually, that we are, on the one hand, we are the first generation, or, or for 100 years or so, maybe, or 50 years, say, we have literally been on the threshold of post-scarcity. We can genuinely create an abundant world, and that will completely transform, people like this suggest, the nature of what it is to be human. Because so much of both social 
and you know, internal psychological uh, repression and insecurity is actually generated around the prospect of just, you know, how do I live for the next day? And so Marx is, you know, it's kind of a sort of side point. Marx's uh, insight, if you like, yeah, cap communism was a concept that preceded Marx by a long time. Marx's insight, if anything, it's kind of yeah, interesting to talk about this here, of course, but, um, but Marx's insight was that, you know, if, if, if communism is anything, then it has to have a material basis. It has to be, it can only start once you've got abundance. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of very quick summary of the scarcity work. And I'll just, you know, so if we could just keep that kind of floating up in the air for a moment. And this, these, these things will, will kind of you know, feed into each other, hopefully. So the second and related thing, and this is going to be, again, a very quick snapshot, but um, again, in some ways related to those Marx comments, is the, is the question around planning. So this is now a second, you know, starting to look at our economy and way of organizing production from a second point of view. And so this, this issue of reimagining the project of planning. So there's two things that I want to, two ideas that I want to plant into your head. And this is that the, if you like, the ideology, the way in which we just naturally think about the nature of our economy at the moment is, and this, and this is, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's very resonant to talk about this here in, in Moscow, given the history of this country, is that, you know, capitalism is based upon markets, the historical alternative to capitalism, you know, the, what, you know, what we saw in the Soviet Union, for example, was based around planning. And those two things are opposite. You know, you've got markets or you've got planning. And so the first thing that I you know, want to say to you is, is that this is actually not true. You know, this is actually one of the, one of the most fascinating, th fascinating how this has come to be so pervasive and how people believe this. But if we actually look at uh, what capitalism is, We've got all of these four companies, to say the least, are all running planned economies larger than the Soviet Union was. And just yeah, think about that. Yeah, and particularly things like Walmart and Amazon. Really, really interesting. We've got you know, incredibly sophisticated planned economies there. And so you know, the first thing is to forget is that capitalism is about markets. Now, clearly, there are markets going on in capitalism. But one of the things that capitalism as, as an ideology does is sort of says, well, markets are our thing, you know, and, and if you like markets, if you like choice, if you like, you know, the absolute, you know, you'd be insane to argue against markets. Of course you would. You know, there's a, a huge dynamism and so on that comes out of that. But markets are, you find markets in almost any society in the world. You know, markets have got nothing to do with capitalism. You, you can look at almost any social form, any economic form, you will find markets there. But one of the things that, in particular, neoliberalism has done is actually somehow claim the idea that if you like markets, if you like that kind of diversity, that, you know, the range of things that goes on there, that you have to then buy into this whole system. Forget that, it's wrong. And equally, the idea that there's no planning going on in capitalism, I mean, try and start a company. The first thing that the bank will ask you if you go for a loan to start a company is where's your plan, you know? You can't, capitalism doesn't work without plans. So, so there's been this incredible um, you know, success, ideological success in recent years of you know, separating these two things out. And one of the things that we need to do, and one of the reasons why this is so interesting to talk about in schools of architecture and urbanism is that the whole, if you like, concept of planning at a, at a you know, our, our mental image of planning, architecture and urbanism provides so many metaphors for that. Um, and cities and buildings are, of course, just, you know, prime factors in, in, you know, in structuring economies in any case. So actually the whole, you know, myself and a number of people have been involved in this idea of, you know, how can we start to reimagine the project of planning is actually one of the first things to do as well. How can we, A, begin to realise the very, what's actually going on at the moment, that there's huge amounts of planning going on at the moment, it's just, it's not democratic, it's behind closed doors, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, ecologically irresponsible and all the rest of it. So how can we, how can we actually um, take the, you know, the, the tools and devices which contemporary companies now have, now have which you know, in, in the following you know, the, the various developments of information technology and so on, mean that there is the possibility of incredibly sophisticated you know, and democratic, democratized forms of planning that, um, you know, that weren't available you know, in this country, for example, 100 years ago. I mean, and that's not 
that's not the only issue with what happened here, of course, but, um, but, it's, but it's a phenomenally important point to make. And of course, you know, and that markets are just, you know, markets have got nothing to do with capitalism. Of course, capitalism uses markets in certain ways, but actually in many ways, markets are less strong in capitalism than they are in, other, in certain other economic forms. And it's certainly not specific to capitalism. Okay, so that's the second point in the air. And so what models are there for, for starting to have more complex ideas about these things? Well, one person who um, has come into uh, increasing relevance again is a cybernetic theorist called Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer was a very interesting guy. He was an uh, incredibly precocious uh, individual. In his 20s, he was uh, running the... He was on the management panel of, of the biggest steel company in, in Europe in the 60s, United Steel. In the 70s... Sorry, that was in the 50s. In the 60s, he was uh, head of IPC. It was then the biggest publishing company on the planet. But by, by the end of the 60s, he was becoming slowly politicised, partly through the growing environmental movement, partly through his own analysis of how companies and how the global economy was developing. He did a series of very interesting books, one called Platform for Change, um, one called The Brain of the Firm. Uh, have a look for his stuff. He interacted with, again, just to, uh, to connect it to some names that you might know from contemporary architectural theory. So when Patrick Schumacher talks about autopoiesis, that's a term that he's taken from two cybernetic biologists, uh, Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. Stafford Beer worked with those two. Um, so Stafford Beer was, when I say a, a cybernetic management theorist, so he was interested, he was a kind of ecologist, if you like. Yeah, he was interested in how complex systems uh, behave and how you can understand organizations, how you can understand companies as organizations how organizations are like organisms, you know, it's not by chance that they have the same root word, and that you need to understand these things in the way that you study uh, living systems and, and, and mental systems. Now, Stafford Beer got involved in an a incredibly interesting project in Chile in the, in the early 1970s, which was short-lived, but is, uh, is, is being you know, revisited a lot by a number of uh, both IT theorists and... Uh, some you know, young political theorists at the moment. And, he, and what happened in, in uh, the early 1970s in Chile was that there was an election of, of a government led by a guy called Salvador Allende, uh, who proposed uh, what he called the Chilean route to socialism. And he basically sort of said, you know, it's, it's, it's not Beijing, it's not Moscow. You know, is there the possibility of a kind of bottom-up model of planning? Allende was an was academic, and he was interested, you know, can, is it possible to have a, a grassroots version of planning? And so this, this kind of idea, again, in, in urban terms now, these are terms that we're starting to get used to, that, the, yeah, that you've got bottom-up systems and top-down systems. And, and we typically think of planning as a top-down system. Actually, these things are, you know, can be much more sophisticated. And so Stafford Beer developed this system called CyberSyn, which was actually... Uh, in many ways, the first, uh, one of the first versions of something like an internet. So it was, uh, it basically set up communications between factories, town halls, um, and had a series of, they started, they got as far as building, completing one of these rooms, but the idea was that there was a series of these uh, rooms spread across the country where, um, yeah, basically local officials would be able to, and, and you know, workers in factories and, and the whole lot were able to, um, yeah, talk about how things were working, how, yeah, how you could um, have a bottom-up form of planning, if you like. Now, one of the reasons for mentioning this is, is as I say, it's been revisited a lot at the moment, and, and it's one of the things that's been revisited in a couple of books. Um, a couple of books which I'm going to mention in a moment. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting diagram from Beer, actually, which, which uh, describes that. So this is his description of, of three different kinds of systems which he calls simple, complex, and exceedingly complex. And you, you can basically sort of see, so you've got deterministic systems, such as you know, tossing coins, whatever, and then you've got what he calls exceedingly complex systems. They are, that is to say, ones which you cannot, um, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in a straightforward way through a simple cause and effect, that you've got feedback systems which are so um, interrelated that you simply have to um, use probabilistic models 
or just find ways of watching what's happening in, in real time. And within that, he includes the brain, the company, and, and, ecolo and economies. And he could include uh, ecologies, actually. Now, these, these interestingly, these um, concepts, and, and a number of the conclusions that we arrived at in the scarcity work have been um, not necessarily always using the same terms, but have, been, have kind of reappeared in the last year in three books that have been published in the last year. And I would recommend that you have all three of these on your shelf. So the first one, the middle one, is uh, a book by Paul Mason. Paul Mason is, is fairly well known in England, actually, because he was a, a mainstream journalist, economics journalist for the BBC uh, for a while. And he's now gone freelance and started producing some exceptionally interesting material. So I, I would, again, if, if you're just on Twitter, do, do, his Twitter handle is Paul Mason News. He's an extremely interesting commentator. Uh, and this book, Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future, in here, and again, I'm, I'm, you know, just a, a kind of one or two sentence summary, but he's, uh, he's basically saying, he's one of the people who says, well, the, the curves that we're seeing here, if, if we, that I was referring to earlier, the, the um, you know, exponential curves, if we, if we stay on our current economic models, they are catastrophic, but they are actually signifying just a total breakdown in our economic models, that actually our entire system of valuation at the moment is, is, is not working given new forms of, of production. So in particular, how um, you know, digital production, how you can just you know, mass produce books, digitally, music, etc. This, this is, you know, actually presents serious challenges for Marxist theory as well. So he's, he's you know, if you like, a post-Marxist. He, he's um, taken on an awful lot of uh, Marx's, you know, the tools that Marx provided, but actually it's sort of saying, you know, the basic things such as the labor theory of value break down now, they don't work anymore. Um, because, you know, actually the, the you know, complex systems and, and the kinds of uh, new forms of manufacturing are suggesting, you know, in, in, the, in the way that we're seeing those graphs, actually serious problems for how we're just conceiving of our economy. Now he then sort of says that there's uh, hope here too, which is that simultaneously, forms of social networking, the, uh, the very things which are causing our problems are actually potential solutions. That we've actually got now IT systems which are in their complexity, you know, approaching the complexity of you know, ecological models, economic models. But, but there's a political struggle for you know, taking control of these things. The second book on the left makes a kind of similar point. These, and these are two... Uh, young political theorists who we've actually been fortunate enough to work with at the uh, RCA a little bit in our group, and we actually had a discussion in our, in our last catalogue, which I can make uh, available to anyone who's interested. So this is Nick Schoenek and Alex Williams. And they, they actually, it's worth searching, one of, the, one of the first things that they published was something called the Manifesto for an Accelerationist Politics. And they've stopped using the term acceleration to some extent because it has... Um, yeah, there's, there's some people using the term accelerationism who, who are uh, more dubious, shall we say. But, but the, kind of, the reason why they were calling themselves accelerationists for a while was saying that the general way in which the, if you like, the green left has characterised a contemporary problem as one of saying, well, we just need to reduce you know, what we're doing, we need to yeah, waste less, we need to consume less, that this is, this is just not going to help at all. This might, you know, this might slow down you know, how far we get along the curve. So, you know, we might last a few more years, but it's not actually going to fundamentally change anything. And that actually the only way forwards is to take on all the you know, technological innovation, but, but take control of it, to socialise it in new ways and to politicise it in new ways. So it's, it's, it's basically saying, you know, capitalism has done its job, you know. I mean, it, it, is, it has taken us to a point where we can, you know, we can, reduce, we can manage cyclical resource flows now. Things like, um, you know, there's not space to talk about it today at all. Jesus, at all. Um, but things like cradle-to-cradle -cradle thinking are, um, you know, quite sophisticated models. If you don't know that, just go and educate yourself on that. Um, William McDonough and... and uh, what was his name? Michael Browngart. Um, and there's a, there's a number of, you know, looking, looking at yeah, cyclical uh, models of economic um, production. 
So, and, and, and to some extent, these can even work within capitalism. You know, I mean, at the moment, capitalism just tends to externalize everything. So it tends to externalize how it gets resources. You know, it almost pays nothing. You know, it, it tends to um, primitive accumulation, as uh, Marx famously called it. You know, it kind of steals resources, typically, and then it externalizes waste. So companies, as far as possible, try to externalize anything complex and difficult and tend to produce linear chains where you, know, you dig stuff up, you use it, and then you throw it away, and you've got this kind of you know, general landfill type problem. But there are other ways of, you know, there's ways of managing these things cyclically, and in particular using contemporary technologies, that is possible. And one of the most interesting politicized ecological theorists is uh, Jason W. Moore. And again, this, this book has just come out in the last year, Capitalism in the Web of Life, which I can't really uh, touch upon time-wise. But I, I would say these are, these are the three course books that we, I'm using in, in sort of various things I'm teaching there. It's complicated. It's not, and, and, and it's, I'm just going to now turn to look at some of the work that we've been doing in the studio. And what you're going to see, there aren't straightforward answers to this, but one of the, one of the things which is interesting is that or at least the kind of position we're advocating, is that the general way in which sustainability and so on has been thought about in design, it's, it's, it's not the way forwards. I'm absolutely certain of that. that at, the mo at the most, it's just going to, you know, it buys us a bit of time, but that's it. We actually need to come up with completely different ways of theorizing how we design, what our nature to um, ecological and economic systems is, the kinds of drawings we might need to do for that, the kinds of imagination we might need to do for that, how we even begin to think about planning. I'm now going to yeah, very quickly jump through a series of projects that make some, that make some suggestions perhaps in that area. But these are um, yeah, three things, a few things floating in the air. Ah, so this is, uh, fortunately enough, again, just partly mentioning this given this particular setting and Cool House's relationship to it. So I was fortunate to do an interview with Cool House a couple of years ago that was published in a radical philosophy journal. And in there, he, he returned to actually something he said before, where he makes, I think, an incredibly um, useful and, and important point. That, yeah, we need to reinvent a plausible relationship between the formal and the social. Myself and David sort of went on to say, well, we actually need to include the ecological in that as well. But that, yeah, that basic premise of how do we, the role that f the form plays in producing Producing mental maps for us to navigate the world we're in is, is an incredibly important role that architecture and design um, plays. And I think it's quite an interesting article, actually, so you can find that online. Okay. So accelerating through, you know, rather than turning back, you know, so much of, of sustainable thought and, and green thought has, has been, you know, in a sense, about taking a step back. What we're advocating is, is accelerating forwards through and beyond capitalism. Okay, so this is one project from this year. This was uh, Johnny Liu in, in the studio. And this is a, a number of our projects were, yeah, really caused difficulties for a few people because it wasn't clear yeah, to what extent they're post-capitalist, to what extent they're kind of hyper-capitalist. And I think that's a kind of interesting um, tension. So what Johnny produced was um, a new planning portal for the city of London. So at the moment, there's a, there's a kind of crisis going on in the city of London in, in that basically yeah, ex existing planning methods are not keeping up with the way in which space is being, the ways in which space is being used as a form of speculation. And so this was um, creating a, a, a kind of virtual version of the city of London Effectively, it was one of those projects where, you know, I often sort of say this to students, that you need to commit yourself to the project, and you might end up doing things that you don't even personally like, but if you're committed to the project, you know, at least follow through it to its logical conclusion to see, you know, to test it as an experiment, to see, you know, what truth or otherwise it holds. So what he ended up here, this wasn't the initial intention, but basically it ended up producing a tool that would facilitate either a new form of planning were it to be politically seized, as it were, or in, in a, you know, a more likely contemporary London scenario, basically a futures market in space, in space production within the city of London. You ended up producing um, a series of, of 
designed objects which would never even be built, what he would call tactical objects, the kind of thing that's already happening in, in planning applications in London, where people are putting in planning applications just to change the system a bit with no actual intention of certain things being built, but simply in order to then facilitate other applications elsewhere. Um, so again, you've got this sort of situation where, on the one hand, capitalism is, is, is developing quite complex forms of planning, you know, quite complex relationships of ways of thinking about futures. Um, but at the moment, in just wholly irresponsible, profit-driven ways. But these are, but these are methods that can be uh, potentially seized. And these are just some visuals. Uh, this, this was literally written, first of all, it was done as a, um, a, a, a kind of sketch model. He's actually on the edge of releasing this as a, um, a working website that people can, can play with. A number, a number of the projects I'm going to show you very quickly have used game theory in various ways. So game theory, um, again, actually coming out of cybernetics and systems theory, uh, attempting to look at multiple futures simultaneously. And, and there's a huge amount of work been done over the last 40 or 50 years around game theory. Interestingly, the Greek um, former finance minister, Varifakis, uh, is, is actually one of the most interesting scholars on this. He's done a very interesting book on game theory. This is, a, this is another project that... Um, Wallpaper magazine last year uh, called uh, one of the most important uh, young design projects on the planet. Um, so this was Bonnie UN. And this was, she used game theory, literally created a, a game board based upon, so game theory fed into various war game uh, things as well. There's, there's, yeah, interesting, yeah, this, this is where um, yeah, capitalism and sort of military industrial complex have created tools which can be used in, in other ways. But this was testing and actually playing uh, devil's advocate to some extent. She took a region that was at the, at the corner of uh, India, Tibet, and China, and where China has been, um, actually you might have followed in the recent news, where China has been attempting to manipulate territory in all kinds of ways. So there's a whole series of uh, reefs in the South China Sea that China has been slowly dredging sand onto to turn them into islands, and then once they're islands, it can claim a 200-mile resource uh, uh, boundary around those things. So, so China's actively engaged in manipulating territory at the moment for geopolitical ends. This was uh, a, a game that uh, Bonnie set up looking at, well, how might that work spatially? Set up this game, used uh, one, of the, one of the leading um, geopolitical game theorists from King's College in London, and then actually got representatives from... Um, ver from it got, uh, there was, there was a, a Tibetan uh, activist group. There was um, a Chinese businessman and someone... It was, a, it was an Indian representative, I, I forget right now. But, but literally set this up and played this out as a, um, as a game in various ways. Again, I'm just having to jump through these projects, but, give, but just giving you a series of snapshots of the... Um, things that don't look anything like normal sustainable design, basically. This, this was her presentation wall. At the other end of the scale, this was um, one, of, one of the things that's so interesting about understanding what capitalism is doing at the moment is that you need to look at very, very large scales. You need to think ecologically. Capitalism is working more and more ecologically. And one of, one of the things that actually, you know, again, don't assume that any use of ecology is inherently good. I mean, an awful lot of ec ecological work at the moment is actually facilitating capitalism's greater grasp of things. So an awful lot of ec you know, stuff that's going under the time, term of ecological urbanism, you know, I mean, there's some very interesting stuff there, but there's some stuff that you should be incredibly suspicious of as well. So capitalism is, is, is in, in, in very interesting ways developing ecologically, but it's also developing at incredibly micro scales as well. So, so very interesting work being looked at. Yeah, just how is capitalism changing the brain? How is capitalism changing? Yeah, our, our brains are incredibly plastic things. They're shaped according to the societies we're in. And again, just as design researchers, th these, are, these are scales that we need to be looking at as well. This was a project from a student who um, is, is a biofeedback system, so where, where you could, just showing how spatially, giving yourself feedback about how your um, pulse was working, and then you could change the speed of the lights, and, and you just start to speed up your, your heart. Your heart yeah, you, you, you can make your body go in sync with your environment. So we, we do experiments that kind of you know, move across those kinds of scales. This was a fascinating project. So last year, there was a, a group of, of students in the studio who were gay, lesbian, bi, 
whatever, they formed a, a, a reading group uh, and, and discussion group called Queem, um, which stood for the queer, um, queer Eye on the Architectural Mind. And if you do a search, you'll find some of their material online. Uh, this is Emily, who took on, she became interested in, in how, do, yeah, how, do buildings shape, um, how do buildings shape bodies, how in particular there's been some fascinating work coming out of, sort of feminist and post-feminist theory around identity construction. Um, and ended up developing a project where the design of buildings, it was, she did design buildings, but didn't actually show them in any way, and actually took on the role of just adopting multiple personalities. And this was looking at a near future scenario with um, uh, yeah, contemporary developments again in um, pharmacological uh, research. Yeah, 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 I've got two minutes. Um, and so, yeah, basically just did a series of stage sets. Ended up, did this series, then produced this, and this is going to just look probably weird at this scale. This was an absolutely huge image that she produced that was about five meters long, where basically the hiring and setting up of the stage sets, the photographers, the makeup artists, and so on, was then documented in a book. This was, if you like, a live project, in that, yeah, actually the construction of this image. Um, but that was then just shown as a documentation, and you just then had the large image on the wall. Kit this year was a distinction student who um, took on Athens and took on the uh, paradoxical status of, of the various uh, bits of Athens which are located in museums around the world, worked with an economist to suggest that actually if we can accelerate the movement of those antiquities, they themselves can become a kind of virtual currency. This then came back to um, making a series of interventions on the Acropolis. I can't possibly do, because I'm under time pressure, can't talk about this, but th again, these, this received, um, it was D-Zine. This got an award on D-Zine, so you can find this online. I'm just gonna have to jump through this, but, but again, just showing, I mean, developing different kinds of representational techniques. And also then, just looking at, you know, what are the, where, where capitalism itself is, is moving beyond, um, I mean, one of the interesting things that we keep looking at, if you look at Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is already post-capitalist in lots of ways. There's just so much money there that the, the basic profit motives aren't working there anymore. You know, things that Elon Musk is doing aren't about money. You know, he's, he's, it's, it's interesting. They're, so the, the leading edge of capitalism is already not working according to um, uh, straightforward profit motives. But this was looking at, uh, Francis looking at uh, asteroid, yeah, a very contemporary developments in, and propositions around asteroid mining, and saying, well, what kinds of resources are needed for this, and what kinds of, um, if you like, yeah, architectural imagination might be uh, used into, into um, yeah, sort of near space technologies. Basically proposed, uh, the production of, a, of an ocean in space. There's, there's a series of issues about the necessity for water, for asteroid mining, and for just general um, near future space travel. Worked with, at the RCA we had um, an embedded, as, as uh, a researcher from NASA, um, based in the Royal College. He then contacted a number of other peoples, and we actually, uh, this project got written up in the Journal of British Interplanetary Studies. So it's, it's a fully, this, this isn't, you know, silly speculation, this is, this is yeah, fully approved as it were. Um, and it was basically looking at how you would first of all push asteroids, water rich asteroids out of the um, asteroid belt. How he, he uh, the site he chose was Lagrange point two, which is Lagrange points are a, a, um, a series of points between the earth and the moon of equal um, gravity where if, if you place something there, it will stay there. So basically pushing these water rich uh, asteroids there, you slowly get to a point where these will coalesce and where you will have um, you know, a, new, a new object in the sky. These are actually charting, uh, yeah, actually the, the um, movement paths of these uh, asteroids are through the solar system to the arrival point. These were some initial visualizations of what that might look like. Um, this is, this is the penultimate slide that both uh, Francis used, but which actually, interestingly, this is the, um, the symbol, the uh, Oreoboros, the, um, which actually is a symbol of the uh, American uh, Society of Cyberneticians. 
It's an ancient symbol, but one which cybernetics took on is basically you know, as the symbol of a feedback system. Under pressure, just a reminder again. Um, so this is, this is why we're here. We'll be back on August the 6th, but we'll be doing others as well. So if any of you are interested in joining in, keep an eye on www.derailedlab.org. Thank you. Дорогие друзья, спасибо, что пришли. К сожалению, у нас не осталось времени на вопросы. Сейчас здесь будет э, другое мероприятие через несколько минут. Вы можете пообщаться лично со спикером. Спасибо, что пришли.